massive carbon, a faceful, brand new, an ambitious project. Fast cruising. For this episode, we're in St. Malo for the start of the route to Rum, the single-handed race to Guadeloupe. And it's big. No, I'll correct that. It's massive. Some say it's the biggest offshore spectacle in the world, and it's easy to see why. During the course of the 13 days that the race village is open, two million people will turn up and see some of the most advanced racing machines in the world and 138 solo skippers. We'll walk the dock and talk to some of the key players as we climb aboard their boats. But first... If you've been keeping an eye on the America's Cup calendar as we march towards the big event in Barcelona in 2024, you'll know that September was an important milestone because this was the earliest any of the teams could get back out on the water. The Swiss team Alinghi were the first to do so from their base in Barcelona, aboard a boat that started life as the Kiwi's first AC-75. Freshly rebranded, they called it Boat Zero. Their first day of sailing went well to start with, before quickly turning into a baptism of fire, as a mini storm hit them as they headed for home. Result? Their first capsize. American Magic were also back out on the water in their favourite training ground, Pensacola, aboard their AC-75 from Auckland, Patriot. The rules say that teams can only build one new AC-75 this time around. Unsurprisingly, no one's rushing to build a new one yet. Instead, there's plenty of training, testing and research to take place before the design teams can really finalise their creations. So, to go forwards, teams have two choices. One is to sail an old AC-75, but there are quite a few restrictions on what they can do to them. The alternative is to build a 12-metre test boat, where the rules are more open, allowing more development on foils, rigs and sails and so on. These test boats are known as LEQ-12s. Why? Less or equal to 12. Luna Rossa was the first team to launch theirs at their base in Cagliari in Sardinia. Next up was the British team Ineos, who took delivery at their base in Palma, Mallorca. Meanwhile, down under in Auckland, the Kiwis have been busy scorching around the Haraki Gulf aboard the first AC-40 to hit the water. These are the boats that teams will use for the preliminary regattas ahead of the America's Cup. These will be similar in concept to the America's Cup World Series that we saw in previous Cup cycles. The AC-40 will also be used for the Youth and Women's America's Cup events. It's a cool looking boat that appears to work straight out of the box, which is impressive in itself. All the teams have ordered at least one, they have to, and some have bought two. But there's more to the AC-40 than you might think, because this flying monohull is also available for anyone outside the Cup to buy. Now you may think that's mad, why would anyone think they could handle a boat that requires a balancing act that makes tightrope walking look easy? Well, take a look at this, as Kiwi team member and test pilot Nathan Outridge describes what it's like to sail an AC-40. So the AC-40 is you know, an incredibly complicated boat, but to make it simple and easy as possible to sail for the Youth America's Cup and Women's America's Cup, the systems on board have been designed so that it's actually quite an easy boat to sail despite how complex it is. One of the things that makes the boat so easy to sail is the autopilot. So there's a simple button here on the left hand side which you can just switch the boat into autopilot mode and then effectively for flying the boat you've got two real inputs. You can either adjust the height at which the boat sails or how much foil you have in the water with a simple plus and minus and then there's the trim so you can change the attitude of the boat more bow down more bow up and so you know for someone like myself who has a lot of foiling experience but never sailed a boat like this it's been pretty easy through the commissioning just with the way that the the autopilot software works so then the other uh, panel of buttons here is all to do with the boards up and down system so you've got a board up button and a board down button you can also do a plus and minus on the cant system. So effectively from this seat here, 
you can do all the functions you need for, for flying the boat. So the AC40 sat with four people. You've got two people on each side. As you can see, I'm in a bucket seat here and we've got another one at the back. I'm almost sitting on the floor, so you're incredibly low and out of the wind, and it's the same configuration on the other side. And then the aero trimmer sits behind you and they've got controls for the mainsail and the jib at the back of the boat. So one of the cool things about this is you can choose if you want to trim the mainsail or the jib, because every time you tack and jibe, you know, the way the boat's been designed that the mainsail trimmer will be sitting on the windward side and the jib trimmer will probably be sitting to leeward because they have a much better view of the jib. So a simple button press will switch you from main functions to jib functions. And then you've got a bunch of push buttons. So you've got Cunningham control, the clue position. So you've got the car that slides on the clue. So you're basically creating more depth in the sail or making the sail flatter. When you tack and jibe, um, obviously the mast needs to rotate. So a button actually lights up it turns purple and you push that button and it rotates the mast. So there's a lot of software that's been developed in the background to stop you basically doing any damage to these boats. So, you know, if you're overpowered, you can just hold your finger on the Cunningham, you pump it super hard, it hits a pressure relief, the lights up and says you're at max load and you can take your finger off the button. So effectively, you can just focus on how much power you want upstairs on the sails and, and what kind of heel you want. And so you got one hand on a joystick, doing your heel control and then your other fingers are doing, you know, your, your standard Cunninghams and outdoor setups. Now I know that there'll be those that are saying, that's not sailing, but I'm afraid it is. It's just a different type of sailing. But with flying Nika scorching around the place too, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that others are gonna follow. And given half the chance and someone else's deep pockets, oh, and some talent, I know I would. Winning is usually the most important focus on the race course. And while good looks make no difference to boat speed, creating a visual impact is often just as important. When Jim and Susan Swartz bought the successful Mini Maxi Momo, they wanted to give her a new look. A bold, vibrant new hull colour and a new name, Vespa, was the start. Upgrading her Doyle Sales wardrobe was another, and then came the new graphics. They were designed by Susan, who has had paintings in many exhibitions around the world. Doyle Sales Stratus Sail Art Technology created the images by printing onto the outer surfaces of the sail with a giant printer using sustainable, durable, non-toxic inks. The printed layers were laid down as part of the lamination process and then cured under heat and pressure to make the artwork an integrated part of the sail. What's more, the process is designed to light up the images when the sun is shining through. Perhaps distraction is one of Vespa's tactics. If there's one area in the sailing boat building world that's growing at an impressive rate, it must surely be multi-hulls and performance cats seem to be stealing the show. HH have just revealed one of their latest designs, the HH660. Designed by Morelli and Melvin, the 60 is understood to be the natural successor to the 55 and provides more space and performance. According to HH, seven have been sold already, with five currently in build. One of the key features on the 60 is the large four triangle, which provides plenty of options for multiple headsails, key for changing gear. The forward helm position is an option that has been popular with more than half of the current buyers ticking this box. Another popular choice has been the owner's hull configuration. And with this much space and volume to play with, who wouldn't? Boots, they're a personal thing, and it's hardly surprising. They don't just keep us dry, but are an essential link with the boat. Perhaps that's why we get so attached to our favourites. But sometimes a boot can achieve a cult status of its own. The DeBerry Crosshaven boot was inspired by discussions with four top Volvo Ocean Race sailors. One of the key topics was a request that the gaiter should be an integral part of the boot. So prototypes were made, trials were conducted, and the Crosshaven boot went into production and the journey to the superstar boot began. DuBerry took a similar approach when it came to a new collection of quality crew uniforms for the superyacht market. 
They started by looking at how, when and for what crew use their kit and have now launched their Aquatech range of shirts, jackets, hats, trousers and more. If you like high tech and high speed, this is Offshore Racing's biggest and best toy cupboard. From the offshore sports cars of the class 40s to the giant L teams, the 32 meter trimarans, there is no better showcase for the leading edge of high performance offshore racing. But according to one of the skippers, there's also one class that stands out for being, and I quote, the most dangerous boat on the Route de Rum start line. So, shortly before the start, I went sailing with him to find out why. Earlier on in the year, we ran a story about the pro sailing tour when it arrived in Cowes on the penultimate leg of its circuit. In particular, we featured this boat, Sam Goodchild's 50-footer, 50-foot trimaran, Leighton. He gave us a really interesting tour around the boat and talked about what it was like to sail this boat, both fully crewed and single-handed, which is something he's going to have to do when he takes part in the route to rum. He also said, you really ought to come for a sail. So I did. That was superb. What was our top speed, do you reckon? Uh, we, I think we definitely saw 29, I don't know if we saw 30. So our, the max speed we've done on the boat was in conditions exactly like today, 25 knots flat water, and we've, we hit 38 knots. So we've, there's a little bit more to go if, you, if, you're, um, if you're ready to sheet on the sails and, um, and trust <laughs> the people ready to ease them. <laughs> well, I guess the fear factor sort of increases exponentially, doesn't it? At yeah. what point does it, at what point, is, where's that threshold? Where do you sort of, above what speed do you f start to think, right, we've really got to concentrate here, this is... It depends on, our, I mean, today we had the daggerboard up, which is a massive safety thing. Um, we had two reefs in J2 in, so to make the boat capsize with the center of effort that low, you've got to go for it. Um, so honestly, today we we're pretty safe. Um, and the threshold is where, I mean, anyone could sell this boat to Guadeloupe um, on their own. Um, it's just <laughs> not everyone can do it fast, <laughs> and that's. I mean, that, you put the you put that where you want to, depending on the sea state, depending on things. But really, what gets in the way is sea state, yeah. um, and it's. I mean, it's. It, it, it really, they're not complicated boats. They're quite simple. They're really wide. They're quite stable. And what gets complicated is when you want to go fast. So mm. it's you put, and that's what the whole game is about: is who puts the limit where, when, and how. Um, whether it's three o'clock in the morning coming out of a front on starboard facing to the waves and that's normally when route de rums are won and lost. Where can you put the limit without capsizing? Um, and then sometimes you say, oh, I could go 80% now because I can get some rest and it's a lot more chilled out and I don't want to capsize. And it's really about where do you put that limit when and how. Um, and it is, it's not like a monohull where the limit is there and you're aiming for it the whole time. It really is a, a moving target which you've got to decide really. This, I mean, all of which makes perfect sense. I've heard you say it and many others before, yeah. and I've written about it over the years, and I've had the pleasure of sailing these boats every now and then. But actually, on a day like today, when you get out there, for yeah. someone like me who's not used to multi hulls really, uh, get out there on a day like today, I'll be honest, the whole thing initially feels alien. It yeah. just, you're just being thrown around all over the place. It's like, uh, hang on, uh, what are we yeah. on the edge? And you, and to hear you say, yeah, it's really, really, it's about as safe as you can be, yeah. would not have been my initial <laughs> thought. Yeah, I mean, also, you, I don't know if you noticed, but we never sailed between 100 and 120 today. We were 90, 90, 100, and then we were 130, 140, but we didn't do the bit in the middle, which can get scary. So there's a few things you can do to make it safer. And I mean, like all things, it's once you get comfortable and once you understand what's happening and where the limit is and what's your next move, everything gets a bit more natural. I mean, two years ago, if you, when I became skipper of this boat, if you said, how are you going to sail that across the Atlantic on your own? I would have said, I don't know. <laughs> um, and now, you said that in the summer earlier on. Yeah, yeah, three months ago I said it as well. And even now, like it's, but I mean, what comforts me is everyone else is in the same position as me, <laughs> as the starters. And I mean, it's, 
it, it's it's possible. It's just where do you put the limit? And it's um, I know it's, it's, I find it exciting. I like learning. I like pushing myself, pushing the limits. And it's definitely as, as scary a boat as you can get for that. So it's um, it felt like um, I don't know. It's a dreadful analogy, but it's sort of like a sports car type analogy. I mean, it's quick. It's live. Yeah. It's not the fastest multi hull on the planet. We all know yeah. that, but it feels pretty lively and, and it responds really well, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it is. It is really live. It is. I mean, it's quite small compared to the most 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 multi hulls we find. Like this, even the mod seventies are a lot bigger than this when you get on board and you feel it. And the old teams is a whole nether level. So you're very much closer to the elements, and the waves are all the same size. But we're a smaller boat, so they're effectively bigger. And um, so, yes, I mean, it, I think they're definitely one of the we are the most dangerous boat on the route around the start line. Mm. Um, and it is, but there's eight of us, and we're all in the same boat. So you just gotta. You just got to go fast and be sensible and try and find the bit in the middle where it's where it's acceptable. <laughs> well, the Dream Cup we did actually in July, we so we were it was a horrible race in terms of wind stability, which is really what we hate. Is I mean we can sail in 35 knots if it's always 35 knots, we're fine, um, but it's unstable. And I found myself full main Jenica, which is 280 square meters of sail or something, um, in five knots of wind, kind of all going fine, pitch black, obviously, because these things never happen when it's <laughs> when it's daylight. <laughs> and then finally, I find myself in 25, 30 knots, like today, um, and I go with the wind coming from where I'm trying to get to. So basically, upwind, and there, you, there you're in the middle of the night on your own on your boat, and you're like, you've got to figure this out. And it's quite scary at the time, but what's good is afterwards, you're like, oh, I didn't know I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> so you find that you kind of push your limits and your confidence a bit further. The and trouble is for a lot of people, it's, that's quite a binary experience, isn't it? I didn't know I could do that. The alternative is I didn't, and I'm now sitting on an upturned boat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So no, I mean, it, 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 I, like it, there's ways of managing it. You obviously have the main inside out and the Jenica flapping, and it wasn't, mm. I was by no means quick, but I'd managed a situation which I thought would be scary without with keeping all three hulls in the water or two hulls in the water at this all the time. So it's it's just really about finding the comfort zone and finding, okay, if this happens, what's next? What's my next move? Where's my safety? Is it bearing away? Is it heading up? Is it easing the Jenica? Is it dangling water up, foil down, whatever it is. Mm. Just um just getting more comfortable as to where is the safe place. Good. Well thanks once again. It was a brilliant yeah. Yeah. it was a brilliant trip out and I think as I said to you out there, I've followed these people like you, you indeed and the boat and everything else. And I've always wondered how on earth you do it yourselves and i'm still really no <laughs> further to knowing how you do it but it's uh, it's amazing it's the comfort zone find your comfort zone yeah well i found <laughs> Just mine take some while <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right thanks cool. very much yeah. indeed Simon. Cheers. good luck Thanks for the rest of the season yeah thanks a lot cheers, cheers mate if sailing a 32 meter trimaran that'll cruise in the mid 30s with ease on your own isn't hard enough how about getting it up onto foils this is the latest day to play with the old team tries. Giant carbon platforms designed to fly offshore. And in case you're still old school when it comes to length, yes, 32 meters is indeed 100 feet. Charles Crudelia is the skipper of Gitana. He knows this boat well. Having won the 14,000 mile breast at Long Teat race a few years ago, in this boat sailing double-handed with Frank Camas. This summer, he won the Finisterre at L'Antique as well, with a crew. But this time, he's on his own. There's no getting away from it. This is a very big boat. It might not feel big to you, but it's 32 metres. It's, I mean, it feels big. Does it feel big to you now? No, I, that's funny. Even uh, right now, it's really, <laughs> I, I don't have the feeling. I, mean, I remember the first time I, I, I put my feet on the board, I said, wow, it's huge. But then, very quickly you forget the boat is, is huge, you are inside your small cockpit because the cockpit is not bigger than a, <laughs> a small boat and uh, you manage everything from there. You, of course the loads are huge and uh, when you change the cell it's a long long job but uh, it's easier than I would have imagined. I guess one of the things is the loads are so high so if you have to, when I've sailed them I've noticed that whenever you have to, if you have to move a sail it's so heavy, you, you can't lift anything. No, no, you don't leave the sail. The sail, the sail actually stay in the same position, and uh, we drop them on the on the boat, and we don't, we just, we don't move them. Actually, we, we try to drop them in the position they will, they will be stuck, and uh, it's done. Uh, because I think the sail is 150 kilos. Uh, the, for example, the G0, which is the biggest, so no way you can move it alone. Uh, 
Okay, so the foiling, tell me about how the foiling has changed the performance of this boat. How, how, what has it given you? How much faster does the boat go? And, and in what wind speed do you start to get onto the foils? Yeah, so the, 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 the boats are heavy for compared to an American boat, so we need, we need to, to reach it's 23, 24 knots of boat speed to start flying. And for this speed, you need that minimum of 30 knots of wind. So you, at 30 knots, you cannot sail all, on all the range, but I think uh, are reaching and you can start to fly. And uh, you need 23, 24 knots of boat speed. Then you change world. Then you, as soon as you fly, you pass from 23 to 30 knots. And then you build winds and blah, blah, blah. So your speed increase. So we, we are able to go free not three times, but sometimes 2.5 to three times faster than the wind, uh, a normal boat. And uh, it's also has changed a lot of things. You don't have uh, less nose diving because most of the material where capsizing is nose diving in the big sea state. With the foil, you, you, you don't have this problem. And also, you, you faster you go, more more writing moment you have. So it's quite good. But uh, the, another point is not only about the foils because, um, and, uh, the thing is uh, the dagger board. The dagger board is a T dagger board, and that's what makes the boat so easy to fly now, and uh, and uh, and give you also extra writing moments sometimes because you, Gitana was the first boat to do that. But they, sometimes we pull on when we need power, we pull on the dagger board, and uh, mm -hmm. that's why we, that's where we have increased a lot the speed uh, upwind, and uh, I think this is where we have the peak. Gain compared to non-flying boat, it's upwind in a in a in a in strong wind because we we are able to sail upwind at 30 knots, and uh, and because of the falls now even in big sea state, the boat is quite comfortable and uh, quite safe, and you have no, for example, in neutral you have a, always a danger when you want to change the sails if you are upwind and you want to to go to a, a smaller sail, you have to bear away and and pass. The 90 degrees, which was a multi with, with all the multi I've sailed in my life before we, this flying, it was really a dangerous and tricky. And if you wait too much and the wind is too heavy, oh, you can capitalize just by bearing away. And uh, with the falls, now there is no more difficulty to pass this point. There is no don danger point, and uh, that's quite because uh, you have a gas, the boat accelerates, and the falls push much, and you have no hill. So uh, it's it's quite amazing how, how fast we can go and uh, sail safer than before. How much do you rely, does the whole system rely on the autopilot and the flight control system? How much has that developed over the years to make this yes, possible? Yes, that's also why we sail safely. On, uh, we are much sa safer on the multi-L today, that the pilot has uh, made a big, big gain in terms of managing uh, the risk so my pilot is able to bear away or come up depending on my twin angle if my boat is healing too much uh, uh, my pilot also can manage uh, with the speed so he's, 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 actually we have developed a pilot uh, with pixel uh, so the guy we are working on uh, with frank uh, and uh, we start from a white whiteboard and the idea was we want to do a pilot who drives like a driver. So what 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 are your concern when you drive? Is the speed, is the twin angle, and is the hill. And uh, we, we managed to do that, and it's quite efficient. So it's much safer. And also added to that, the, the pilot, we have also uh, the main sail. Enfin, we have also some. We can e we can ease the, the sails with an automatic system if you are overhealing. So I can choose. If I, for example, on my boat, if I pass 17 degrees of hill, my main cell will is first, and then if I go over, then my front cell will is. Mm. So it's it's really really a big advantage in terms of safety for sure. The Amoka 60 fleet is a record-breaking one already, with 38 entries, the biggest ever in this race. And one of the key drivers for this is the battle to get a place at the next Fondi Globe in 2024. The route to rum is a key to taking the next step for the big one. So too is developing a boat that's faster than anyone else's. And the pace of development aboard the current generation is staggering. 
as I found out when I went to see some of the latest at an event in Lorient a few months earlier. Lorient is the centre of the French offshore world. It's where many of the teams are based. It's also the venue for the Defi Azimut offshore event for the Amoka 60s. For those in the Northern Hemisphere, September is when the season starts to wind down as we head into autumn. But in France and in the offshore world for the Amoka 60 fleet, it's often just the beginning. And this year, the start of term is marked by the Defi Azimut, a four-day event based out of Lorient in Brittany, where 28 Amoka 60s will line up. For many of them, this event is a lead into the route to Rum later this year. But for five teams, this will be an essential event ahead of the ocean race that starts next year. For this, the 60s will race in the fully crewed configuration alongside the fleet of Volvo 65s for the race around the world. While the broad format for this race follows Volvo and Whitbread traditions, the big difference is the definition of fully crewed. For the Amoka 60s, this means four, but no one really knows how this will pan out. At 60 foot overall, the Amokas might look big, but their cockpits and accommodation are pretty small. Fitting four crew and space for an onboard reporter has been a challenge. So who are the five teams that will take part in the ocean race? First to sign up and with way more experience than any of the other teams in sailing a new Amoka 60 fully crewed, 11th hour racing has been the favourite for some time. Skippered by Charlie Enright, the boat was launched in August 21 and since then they've clocked up tens of thousands of miles and four transatlantic crossings. But the competition is now starting to increase. Team Militia is skippered by Boris Herman, who finished fifth in the last Fondi Globe on his first attempt. In July 2022, his team launched their brand new radical and state-of-the-art 60. Crew member Will Harris gave me a detailed tour and I was blown away by just how advanced the next generation of 60s are. You can see the tour by following the link above or in the description below. Another brand new boat is Paul Mayer's Biotherm Racing. As the former skipper of the potent linked out, he knows a thing or two about the latest generations of Imoka 60s and what makes them tick. And while he and his crew have had little time to push her, this will be one to watch. When Robert Stanjek and crew won the Ocean Race Europe last year in an older, non-foiling Imoka 60, we had a feeling they'd be back for the big one. And now they are. Having bought Hugo Boss 6 that finished second in the 2016 Vondi Globe and renamed and rebranded it Goya Environment Team Europe, they know they've got a quick and proven boat and so do their competitors. Skipper Kevin Escoffier is yet to name his crew for the ocean race, and there are no clues to be gained from seeing who steps aboard, because for the Defi Azimut, he decided to sail solo as part of his preparations for the route to Rum. Having finished third and first in his two previous fully crewed round-the-world races, he knows how to get to the front. His boat started life as a new one for a campaign that fizzled out. Since then, it's been modified to include a scow-style bow. The elephant in the room right now, and I feel uncomfortable even suggesting it, is the question as to how many of these boats complete and return from the route to rum undamaged. The pressure is on before the ocean race has even started. Setting aside the five teams that are going to be taking part in the ocean race and just looking at the Amoka 60 fleet for a minute, there are quite a few interesting boats here. One of them is Sam Davies' new initiative's Kerr, her first brand new purpose-built Imoka 60. The other that people are taking a very close look at is the new Chiral, because Jeremy Bayo's new boat not only looks extraordinary with a proper scow bow, the likes of which you will not have seen before, at least not on a modern race boat, but for the rudders, and the ability for this boat, or at least the potential for this boat, to get up and fly like an Amoka 60 hasn't done yet. The issue at the heart of this is that under the rules, Amoka 60s are allowed to use their dagger balls to fly, but they're not allowed T-foils on the rudder 
to help stabilize that flight. So in effect, when they're up on their foils, they are balancing just on one foil around the middle of the boat, which makes it pretty tricky. The answer so far has been to drag the stern in the water, drag the transom along to try and get some kind of support. But that's drag, and drag is slow. So what have Chirard come up with? Well, they've come up with a set of rudders that are longer than anybody else's and also rather oddly angled. Their arrangement is that the leeward one is the one that steers the boat, while the windward one is actually still in the water. That's contrary to what most of them do, because the windward one in the water is the one that gives the stability in the vertical plane and balances the back of the boat. That's pretty clever. Nothing stays still in the Amoka fleet for very long and Chiral is a very good example of that. Sam Davies is no stranger to the Vendée Globe. Indeed, she's no stranger to the Route de Rum and many other offshore races. And as a result, she's no stranger to the constant development in the Amoka scene. So what does she make of this record-breaking lineup? There's a group of new boats um, that have all been launched, which is really good because um, we have this kind of four-year cycle which leads us up to the Vendée Globe. So um, like Initiative Co, I think all the other boats um, have that objective to get to the Vendée Globe. Um, and uh, with my team, we said, well, if we can't do the route drum with the boat that we're doing the Vendée in, then it's not worth doing a new boat later than this. So, um, and I think four years ago, there was only Chahal, that was the only new boat that did the route de Rum. Um, and now there's a whole group of new boats in the race. So you can see how the fleet's kind of evolving to that idea of trying to um, get your boat fully tried and tested a lot earlier on in that four year campaign. As far as the boats are concerned with the foils, we're now sort of getting used to seeing huge, great big foils out the side of the boat. But, <laughs> It is still a bit bizarre, <laughs> to be honest, but we are getting more used to seeing it. Talk us through what that means in terms of the change in performance in these boats, because you were sailing the original ones that just had straight dagger boards, and we've now leapt forward. For those that have not been following the development that closely, what has it actually meant for the boats themselves and how you sail them? Um, so, uh, well, I'm kind of an, uh, an example of that because my last initiative curve was a boat that was designed with dagger boards and we put foils on it. And um, so basically the hull shape was a hull shape that was an Archimedes uh, uh, shape with foils added. So there was obviously um, uh, limits to what we could do because the hull really didn't go with what with the foils. Well, actually, my last boat is this one right here, and then Michele, and that's the oh, old it? initiative curve. Ah. Um, and, uh, we did a really good job with that, but obviously I could feel the limits of the, the hull shape. And now, um, and even in the 2016 uh, group of boats that were designed with foils, um, they were designed with foils when nobody was really sure if it was going to work. And they, so the hulls were still designed basically to work um, if the skippers realised the foils weren't an advantage in the Vendée Globe. And so it's only been since 2020 where the designers, the teams and the skippers have accepted the fact that yes, the foils work and we will use them all the way around the world. And so the hull shape can then be adapted to um, that type of sailing. Um, and so, yeah, this generation of boat is um, optimising that and, uh, and we're using the foils all the time. Are you finding that with the development of the foils and the development of the autopilots that you're having to learn to sail the boat in a different way as a result? Oh uh, yeah, definitely. And um, and when the f uh, you're right, when you, the boat goes up on its foils, there's there's this jump in um, not just necessarily for the height because you kind of get used to that, but also in boat speed. And there's certain um, so you you kind of never really do so you you go. 8, 9, 10, 10, 11, 12, 13 knots and then suddenly you're at 18 because that's when the foils take off and um, and the boat lifts up and the drag reduces and um, and so just a massive acceleration and obviously then, <laughs> then all your sails flat because you're going way faster so there's that um, that you have to find and which is fine when you've got a crew because then you can adjust everything quickly but when you're single-handed you can't do that so you've got to find that trim so that when you're asleep if for some reason there's a um, the wind drops a bit and and you go go the wrong way around that down that gap then your boat can take off again without having to readjust all 
we adjust the sails. Um, so yeah, there's a different way of sailing, but when you're sailing single-handed, you have to work around that um, uh, to have. So it, yeah, it's all about having flexible kind of sail settings. And presumably that's changing the design of the sails as well to be able to be more tolerant of big changes in apparent wind angles and the rest of it. Um, yeah, it's changing the sail design and um, and uh, luckily we're now as our boat design is is improving as well and the foil design so we're going more and, we're going quicker more and more often um, and so you can end up having flatter sails because you can you, you're more likely to stay up on on your foils where I can see the difference between this boat and my last boat um, where these foils they they um, they just keep pushing, even if you, you kind of slow down or wipe out, then they'll, they'll just go, the boat will just go again um, without really adjusting anything. Whereas with my old boat, you had to kind of ease everything out and, start and again. twist and <laughs> twist, and then, and then it would take off and then you could start again. Mm. Of, the, of the videos I've seen of you sailing so far, you look very happy indeed. In fact, <laughs> ecstatic most of the time. <laughs> Some of the time I look terrified, I think. <laughs> oh, I didn't see those ones. I must look those up. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thanks very much, Sam, and, and really you. good luck. Thank you. This is quite a gig here, isn't it? <laughs> it really, really is. I mean, the sheer number of boats, but then the size of the Amoka fleet and all of the new boats that are in for this race, it's phenomenal. It's the biggest race I've ever sailed in, definitely. Yeah. Um, it's going to be more about finishing the race than about being competitive because of this need to get the miles in. Um, but, you know, it, it's really interesting to be able to see how the new boats perform. Um, and also, you know, we're looking at possibly what our Vendée lineup is going to be. So, so it's good to kind of get the measure of some of the other skippers as well. And how's your campaign going as far as getting to the line? You did the Vendée Arctique, you, you survived that one, and that was <laughs> a, a tough one by the looks of it. But you've also been out, I noticed, been out in, in the Atlantic testing, training. How are things going? What are you learning at the moment? Um, I mean, we've had such a lot of really light winds this year. So that's been a good thing because I felt at the beginning of the year, I did some heavy wind stuff down in Portugal. And I felt that in, both in the Vendée Arctique and the Bermude Mill, kind of I was lacking in terms of my ability to get the boat going in lighter breeze. And um, we had around Britain and Ireland where I got to sail with just the most incredible team. Um, and we had light winds. Uh, <laughs> so that kind of was like an extended coach period for me and and I definitely feel a lot more confident about that um, and then just in the in the weeks prior to coming over here we've had some breeze come through and I've taken that opportunity to go out and roam around the English Channel um, just get, getting my confidence back in the bigger breeze um, and managed to pop in a single-handed world record attempt as well so <laughs> <laughs> Which was? Uh, solo around the Isle of Wight. Uh, it's yet to be ratified, but I think I've set a new overall record. Oh, fantastic. I didn't even know that myself. I should have known that. Shame on me. <laughs> uh, well, no, I, I sort of did it covertly uh, at five o'clock in the morning because there was a nice front coming. So it, it was all a little bit un undercover. <laughs> And so how long did it take? Um, I did it in four hours and 49 minutes. And you mentioned about just getting there was is important for you and I can fully understand that and when you walk down the pontoon here and look at the range of particularly the new generation boats and things like Chiral and some of the really advanced I mean Chiral is probably the most advanced boat there is here but it strikes me they run a very high risk as well because they're trying to do things technically that may or may not work and in the context of getting into the next Vendée Globe how much of a risk is that do you think? Um, so, I mean, this is going to be a really interesting race to watch. I think there are lots of newly launched boats. I mean, the new boats have different criteria for getting in. They just have to sail a race in, finish a race in 22 or 23 and 24. So there is less, there is less pressure on them. Um, 
Uh, and I mean, some of them, I think Biotherm, uh, Paul Mayat's boat has hardly done any sailing at all. Boris said to me the other day, he's not done any solo training. Um, and I think, you know, the interesting thing about the boats going to do the ocean race is how much pressure is on them uh, to finish this race, but then to get the boat back, to turn it around for the ocean race. You know, there's so many different competing objectives and, and needs within the fleet. You know, that I, I think the people that undoubtedly will sail a brilliant race are Charlie Dallan um, and Tom Arion because they've both got new boats coming. Um, and I think, I think Jeremy will too because he's got time. He does have time, he's got time, he's got budget, he's got a, a good team behind him and he doesn't have the pressure of the ocean race. So I think those are the three to watch, definitely. If there's one stretch of water that can split opinions in Europe, it surely has to be the North Sea. It's a tough place, famous for tough weather. So when it comes to the North Sea regatta, it's hardly surprising that this event has also developed something of a reputation. This year, North Sea Week celebrated its 100th anniversary and drew over 100 boats and 1,000 sailors and included the biennial 510-mile Pantaneous Round Skagen race. The offshore classic starts from Helgoland, rounds the notorious Skagerrak and finishes in the Baltic port of Kiel. And while the next round Skagen race isn't until 2024, plans are afoot to run an alternative offshore race in the odd-numbered years in between. Such is the pull of the notorious North Sea. It seems like the bigger the reputation of an offshore race, the more likely it is to be described by just two words. The Fastnet, the Hobart are two good examples, and so is the Transpac, the 2,225 mile American classic from Los Angeles to Hawaii. Next year we'll see the 52nd edition of a race that is famous for delivering a downwind sleigh ride across the Pacific. Yet the reality is that despite the apparent simplicity of a course that has just one turning mark 26 miles from the start before a 2,200 mile leg that follows, winning this race is never straightforward. The light winds of the North Pacific High make sure of that. What is certain is that by the time crews approach the finish, few want to get off. So it's not difficult to see why the Transpac continues to prove so popular and why it has just two words in its name. While inshore and offshore foiling is often stealing the show, there's still plenty going on elsewhere in the high performance world, especially among the Maxis. Here, there's one boat that's been the talk of the dockside for some time, the new Club Swan 180. Her first event was at the Maxi Yacht Rolex Cup in Sardinia. Planet Sail was invited to step aboard and take a close look. Clearly, it wasn't an offer to turn down. You can see the full feature in the boat kit and comments playlist, but here's a taste of why this launch was so special. Now Tour Swan think big, they always have, but even for one of the oldest and most successful high quality builders in the world, their latest launch takes even them into new territory. foot flat out racing one design for owner drivers. Oh, and one that can be used for cruising too. No one has achieved this yet. So why does Swan believe they can? This year has been a good one for getting back out and doing boat tests. Heading back to the multi hull theme, here's one that impressed me this summer, a performance cruiser built by Beneteau. But why? 
You can see the full test on Boat's Kit and Comments playlist, but in the meantime, here's a quick look at the XS15. The last time the Dusseldorf Boat Show took place, we were all blissfully unaware that the world was going to shut down for a couple of years. But now, as life gradually returns to normal, we're starting to remember where we left off. One of the new brands that caught my eye in Germany back in 2019 was the XS range of cats. The plans to have a new range of five models from 11 to 15 metres long was bold and ambitious, especially as XS was a new arm of Group Veneto, who already had the Lagoon range of cats. But apparently the target for the XS range was to be more performance orientated. And this is the flagship of the range, the XS15. She was passing through our patch, so we thought it was only sensible to take her for a sail. The first thing you notice is that compared to most of the boats in the river, she's big and she can't help feeling a little self-conscious. But out in the Solent and underway, that feeling soon disappeared. With a decent breeze and nothing in our way, I was surprised at how quickly we settled in and particularly surprised at my own first impressions. Well, I have to say, this isn't what I was expecting. Although I'm not quite sure what I was expecting. Because if I'm honest, to me, a lot of the cruising multi hulls dare I say it, tend to look the same. But you don't want to make that mistake with this boat, because it certainly isn't the same at all. The thing I love about this already is that it really is definitely a sailor's boat. The first thing you notice is that it's so direct on the helm. I mean, it is just like sailing a monohull. So you feel very much in control of the boat straight away. The sail plan is a good, decent sized sail plan that's pretty efficient as well. And she just picks up. We came out here, it's blowing about uh, 18, 18 to 20 knots at the moment. But when we first came out, there's about 12 knots of breeze and we were doing 10 knots on a beam reach. And she just seems to want to do 10 knots, whatever you do. We put the code zero up a little later on, and then we're at uh, 12, 13 knots. But sails really well, feels really good on the helm. The control lines are all very close to hand. They are all led back, pretty much all of them anyway, are led back onto the starboard side, which makes it very easy to reef and uh, ease and sheet the jib now, one of the considerations on pretty much any cruising cat is tacking. They're clearly not as nimble as monohulls, but I've been very impressed with this one. Going through a tack, it's really not a major issue. I'll just check into windward, just to make sure we're okay. We've got about 23, 24 knots of apparent wind. So that's probably about 17 knots true. Admittedly, it's a very flat sea state, so in some ways you've got ideal um, conditions. But attack is no more difficult than this. As we went into the attack, we were sailing at about 50 degrees apparent. We had 10 knots boat speed. Come through the tack, out the other side, keep the bow down. We've slowed down to about six knots. I'm, I'm going to hold the bow down. Just go down to about 50 degrees, maybe 60. Probably don't need to. No, 50 degrees apparent. We're already at nine knots, 10 knots, and we're off. And that's at uh, 50 degrees apparent. Just going to come back up now, up up to 40 degrees. It really is as easy as that. We've probably got ideal conditions really for it. But even so, I've definitely sailed boats that multi hulls that don't perform like that. With the sailing trials ticked off, it was time to take a closer look at her accommodation. And as we made our way back up the river, she felt like she shrunk. She then demonstrated how nimble a big cat can be under power, before going large once again. When it comes to her accommodation, the first thing that you notice, in fact you can't miss, is that there's just so much space. But then again, I guess we shouldn't be surprised. She's 15 meters long after all, and she's eight meters wide. So this is sort of familiar territory for this type of uh, multi-hull. 
But the other thing you notice is the styling. And it echoes in many ways the style on deck as well, in that it's a very simple, straightforward layout, but it's very, very nicely done indeed. But apart from just the volume that's available in this starboard hull, the other thing that strikes me is once again, it's the subtlety of the styling and the detail. One good example of that is this ring frame. Well, it's actually a cover over one of the structural members, one of the structural ring frames in the hull. But rather than covering it up and putting it behind other surfaces, they've decided to make a feature of it. And I think it works pretty well. It also accentuates just how beamy these hulls are actually and how much space there is within the structure of these hulls. Which when you look from the outside is quite interesting because they're chined right down just above the waterline. These hulls are chined so have a slightly narrower waterline beam where it matters, where you don't want the drag, but you get the volume up here. Other little details I like, well I do like these little sort of leather pockets and the simplicity of the arrangement. And once again, it seems to sort of echo this, the, the same thing on deck where simplicity and ease of operation and just being a little bit more stylish and chic makes all the difference. One of the big advantages of CATS is that you get two engines. Not only does that give you the advantage of redundancy, but it also helps when it comes to manoeuvrability. It means that you can turn even a big boat like this around on their own length. These engines, it's twin 57 horsepower Yanmars. So once again, and from here in St. Malo at the start of the Route to Run race, thank you so much for watching. Please do keep sending us your comments. We read them all and it means a lot to us. Please do keep liking us, check us out on Facebook, maybe even let us know what you're up to. Anyway, stay safe, stay well, until next time.